Verse 15, And in those days Peter stood up in the midst of the disciples and said, The number of names together were about 120. So he said, Men and brethren, this scripture must needs have been fulfilled, which the Holy Ghost, by the mouth of David, spake before concerning Judas, which was God to them that took Jesus. For he was numbered with us, and he obtained part of this ministry. And now this man purchased a field with a reward of iniquity, and falling headlong, he burst asunder in the midst, and all his bowels gushed out. And it was known unto all the dwellers in Jerusalem, insomuch as the field is called in their proper tongue, a Seldama, that is to say, the field of blood. For it is written in the book of Psalms, Let this habitation be desolate, and let no man dwell therein, and his, his bishopric, whatever that word is there, let another take. Wherefore, of these men which have company with all of us at the time that the Lord Jesus went in and about among us, beginning from the baptism of John unto that same day that he was taken up from us, must one be ordained to be a witness with us of his resurrection. And they appointed two, Joseph, called Barsabas, and was surnamed Justice, and Matthews. And they prayed and said, Thou, Lord, which knowest the hearts of all men, show whether these two thou hast chosen, that he may take part in this ministry and apostleship from which Judas by transgression fell, that he might go to his own place. And they gave forth their lots, and the lot fell upon Matthias. And he was numbered with the eleven apostles. You may be seated. Pray with me. Lord, thank you for guiding us back to your house tonight. Thank you for putting something in our hearts tonight that gave us a desire what to, what to come out and sing with your people and Lord, look to your word for guidance and be assembled together as your word instructs us to be. And Lord, I pray that you bless us for that tonight, Lord. Not because we're being obedient, but Lord, we're here because we know that we need you. We realize our sin and we realize that we can't make it in this world without you. And we call on your name and look to your word for guidance. So please give us that word tonight, that which we stand in need of. And I pray that you please send the Holy Spirit to help guide us in planting your word inside of our hearts so we can apply it to our lives. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. So let me catch you up. There was a lot of reading there. You might think you got lost somewhere in there. Let me give you the, the my version of what just happened. Jesus told him what was, uh, he said, I'm leaving you. Uh, you're going to have to do this. Uh, you're going to have to have faith this morning. You're going to have to wait on the power. And I want you to go out into all the world and spread the message. But I want you to wait until I send the power to go with you. So they went back. Jesus is gone. He ascended into heaven. I don't want to say that lightly because that right there is one of the most powerful miracles listed in the Bible that a lot of times we don't even think about. The fact that they got to see Jesus ascend up into heaven. And what a sight that that probably was. Nothing like anybody had ever seen before. We, we saw people rose from the dead. Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead. But never has people been able to see somebody ascend up into heaven in the manner that Jesus did. But now they go back, and now they've got to go back to Jerusalem, and they've got to wait on the Lord. And so what did they do? It says that they all got together, all 12 disciples, they all got together with the, with the other women, and they all come together, and they was praying and uh, praising the Lord. And to me, that sounds a lot like church. It says in verse 15, they, uh, they, there was about 120 of them. Now, I don't think there's 120 of us here tonight, but... Uh, this sounds a whole lot like church to me. This is what we do. We come to the Lord's house, come together in a room, and uh, we call on the Lord. We pray to the Lord. We look to His Word for guidance. So they were doing all the right things. They were doing all the right things up to this point. But what I want to bring to your attention is what the Lord has called them to do. I then read it to you in verse 4, but He told them to wait. To wait. So imagine and put yourself in their shoes for a second. They have just saw one of the greatest miracles ever. They saw Jesus himself 
ascend up into heaven and two angels up there waiting for them. And the angels spoke to them. They heard this. They saw this. Nothing had ever been seen or saw in the world like this forever. They just got off of a crusade of 40 days with Jesus teaching them after he had been resurrected, telling them what to go out and proclaim to all the people. These guys are on fire. They're ready to go out and just tell the whole world and just ready to just let them have it. And what does Jesus tell them to do? He says, wait. He says, wait. Now, obviously, there must be a lesson to be learned here if uh, we see such a contrast. And, and so he left, and then all of a sudden, when they went back to Jerusalem, and they went to the upper room, we see a time period here for several weeks, maybe even a couple months, where nothing, nothing. Have you ever been like that before? You, you kind of come off of that high with the Lord and you see Him so clearly. You see His presence. You hear His word. You know you're right in the center of His will. And then all of a sudden, it's just like He's gone. He's not there anymore. And there was silence. And they got scared. They didn't know what to do. I've always uh, I've heard this, and it makes a lot of sense, but you know the, the teacher is always quiet when it's test time. And that's what we're getting ready to receive right here is hey, they were getting ready to have one of their first tests since Jesus left them. And we'll see that I don't think they did too good of a job, to be honest with you. They started off really good. They started off going to church. They started off praying. They started off, it says, uh, they all continued with one accord. That's hard to do by itself for everybody getting one accord. So you know they must have had the right heart. They come together in prayer and supplication. They did it from their heart. They were coming to church for the right reasons. They were probably singing hymns. They were doing all the right things, but God was not there. They could not feel his presence. Jesus was no longer with them. What are they doing wrong? Can you imagine the thoughts going through their head? So somebody had to do something. And leave it to Peter. Leave it to Peter. So Peter comes in and Peter decides he's going to do some things to get some things going. So the first thing that I want to bring to your attention right here, and the very first thing I see is we're talking about patience. We're talking about power and patience. How there is power and patience. Because God told them to wait for his power. And they had to have patience on that. And they did good for a little while, but... After two days, after three days, after a week, after two weeks, three weeks, a month, two months, after a point, we start to lose patience. And we start trying to come up with something. Something needs to be done. Something we need to interject something in this to be able to do. God is wanting us to do something. It's already been two weeks. It's already been three weeks. Come on, Lord. What do you want us to do? But we got to remember that God's timing is not like our time. And you all know this. You've heard this since you was a, a child. You remember back the scripture of 2 Peter 3, 8. It says, But beloved, be not ignorant of this one thing, that one day is with the Lord as a thousand years, and a thousand years is one day. So what does that, what does that scripture <laughs> tell you? i tell you what it tells me. It tells me that God doesn't have a watch like we have. God doesn't have a watch with numbers on it. God's time is not like our time. He may not even call it time. We come up with time. He give us time by the sun and the moon. We can tell time and we come up with numbers to be able to tell time. But that's all stuff that we make. But God's timing is something totally different. God's timing, it, now I've heard a lot of people say that, you know, 1,000 years is like <laughs> one day. But he throws it around the other way too. He says a thousand years is like one day, and one day is like a thousand years. What that means is you cannot make sense of it. None of that makes sense. You cannot try to figure out God's timing. Don't ever try to figure out God's timing. And so the first point that I see here, if we want to have patience, if we want to have patience and wait on the Lord, which is a great attribute that he tells us to have, I would say that patience requires patience. Patience requires patience. Now that sounds like a dumb comment, I know, but if you think about it, that's, that's exactly what we need to hear right now is because we all talk about patience, we all need patience, but we don't want to have the patience in order to be patient. It's not even in our mind to be able to consume the thought of how much patience we're going to have in order to have a 
enough patience for God's timing. We can't put a time limit on it. We can't say that if I've not heard something in three weeks from the Lord, then time's up, I've got to do something. Because three weeks means nothing to the Lord. It's all His. It's all one time. It's God's watch does not have numbers on it. Instead, God's watch has a purpose on it. See, when God wants to implement something, it's because it's a time for something for Him to implement a purpose. So His watch, He's waiting to be able for the perfect God's timing to be able to make something happen in order for Him to get the most glory out of it. In order for good to come out of it. In order for there to be a purpose out of whatever is getting ready to happen, that's when He says it is time. Not 2 o'clock, not 3 o'clock, not 2 weeks, not 3 weeks. We've got to understand that right off the very beginning. But the church was doing all the right things here, but the Holy Spirit never showed up. Never showed up. See, the Holy Spirit is on God's time, not on our time. The Holy Spirit is part of God. It's part of His threefold being. And so we've got to understand that we don't get to tell the Holy Spirit when to show up. Now, you've got to understand that. That, that, that sounds good, but we don't understand this as Christians. I, I haven't understood it for a long time. We have in our head that we have this formula that automatically all we have to do is do this, 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 and this, and the Holy Spirit will come down. And if we didn't get the Holy Spirit, then that means that we didn't do this, this, and this right. Now, there's a little bit of truth to that because I believe that the Holy Spirit does have some requirements of things for it to come together, for Him to be invited, for Him to be welcomed, for Him to be able to come and be a part of a service. But we do not have the ability to be able to tell the Holy Spirit when and when not to come. We can invite Him, but we can't do that. There's a lot of, I think a lot of churches, a lot of people that, that have this in mind that they think that if they can get their self worked up enough, if they can get fired up enough, if they can yell loud enough, if they can sing loud enough, if they can get excited enough that they can have enough motion, emotion for the Holy Spirit to come in. But that's wrong. The Bible tells me that's wrong because they had all that. They had the emotion. They just come out of the greatest high that they ever had. They just saw Jesus Christ ascend up into heaven, saw all these miracles. Then on top of that, they were already in one accord. Then on top of that, they were praying. They was looking to God for the answers, but the Holy Spirit did, still did not show up in those days. That's powerful. That means that just because church sometimes we're, uh, we don't necessarily get to experience the Holy Spirit here with us doesn't necessarily mean that we're doing a bunch of stuff wrong. We just need to keep on doing what we're supposed to be doing and the Holy Spirit will come when His purpose and His timing says He needs to come and He wants to do something in this church. It may be that we have to, the Lord is, and the Holy Spirit is going to stay quiet for a while in a time period, and that's part of the test, is to see how long will you last without the touch of the Holy Spirit touching you and you feeling His presence, how long will it take for you to get discouraged? How long will it take for you to be able to get to the point where you say, well, I'm going to skip out on Sunday night? Or you just say, well, I, you know, I don't think I need to necessarily go, or I don't need to do this, or I don't need to share my testimony, or I don't need to... See, that's where Satan starts te tempting us, and he starts getting in our heads a little bit, is when we're not getting what we're wanting. That's when he does, does that. So there is, there is power within the unity of the church. All the right things were there, ready for the Holy Spirit, but the Holy Spirit didn't come until his time was so we have to have patience on top of patience in order to make sure that we're staying within God's will. That's the first thing that I see here. The second thing that I see is that patience looks ahead, not behind. Patience looks ahead, not behind. And let me tell you where I get that at. Is what, that's what we're talking about here. And in this lesson, I see a lesson of patience. And in verse 15... We can imagine that Peter's probably going to be the first one to fail the text. Peter's the one that Peter's the one that when he walks into the room, he's ready for the fight. Peter's the one that's got all the energy. Peter's the one that, believe me, you would have really liked Peter. Peter was just a, a kind of guy that just had all kinds of energy, and he was ready to go. So Peter had lost patience. Peter didn't have any more patience. Peter, Peter never did have much patience to begin with, to be honest with you. He's the same one that cut off the ear of the soldier. He's the same one that always was right in the middle and quick to open up his mouth. Yet he's the one that Jesus chose to make the, the rock of the church. He's the foundation of the church. That's not by accident. He's showing us that even as the church, we're going to make mistakes. But he still loves us. He still
still chooses us to be the voice. He chooses us to be the foundation of his gospel. But here's what Peter did. Peter, he made the mistake, and you can tell he don't have patience, because instead, if he had had patience, he would have been looking out ahead, trying to see what the Lord is going to do. Lord, what do you want me to do? Lord, what are you getting ready to send my way that you want me to prepare for? That's where Peter's mind should have been. But instead, here's where Peter's mind was at. Peter's mind was in the past, and he was thinking on the betrayal of Judas. That's where his mind was at. He was sitting here, and weeks went by, and he was trying to figure out what's going on. He said, I know why the Holy Spirit's not come. Because Judas, he was one of the twelve, and he was he had the devil in him. He wasn't the real thing. God is waiting for us to reunite the twelve. And before he's going to send the Holy Spirit, everything's going to be perfect before he comes. So that's it. He even Peter even used scripture to be able to justify his thoughts and why he believed this. That tells me that Peter was even reading God's word, trying to figure out what's going on. He was doing everything right. Except he made this one mistake. One mistake. He was looking to the past. He was trying to fix the past and trying to, instead of trying to fix the future. Do you know that you can't fix your past? There is no such thing as fixing your past. You cannot go back and fix anything in your past. The only thing that you can do is to fix your future. The only thing that you can do is make your future so bright that nobody cares about your past anymore. That's the only thing that we can do. Uh, we should be able to look at Paul's life and be able to see that. How many times do you think Paul would have loved to be able to fix his past? All the times that him as, as Saul went out and persecuted all those Christians, but he couldn't take none of that back. As much as he wanted to, everywhere he would go in the cities, he'd go into that city in Jesus' name, ready to proclaim the gospel, and they'd throw that back in his face every single time. Aren't you the one that persecuted us a long time ago? How am I supposed to listen to you? You don't even, you don't really genuinely love this. You're just blowing at the mouth again like you was 20 years ago. He couldn't change that past, but he could change his future. So by focusing on the future and saying, you're right, I made so many mistakes in the past, but now I see clearly. But now I met somebody that's changed my life. Now let me tell you my testimony. Now let me tell you what I was a witness of. Now he's focusing on the future. Things are different now, and that's what Paul learned. Peter hadn't learned that yet. He's still trying to figure things out by, by looking at the past. And we can't do that. If you're stuck in the past, you're never going to gain ground in the future. You can't get stuck in the past or you're not going to be going anywhere. Philippians 3, 13 and 14, it says, uh, Philippians chapter 3, verse 13 and 14, it says, Brother, I count not myself to have apprehended, this is Paul speaking by the way, to have apprehended, but this one thing I do. Forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forth into those things which are before, I press towards the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Jesus Christ. You think Paul learned his lesson? I think Paul learned that he can't, he can't change his past, but, and he can't do nothing about it. So you can't focus on your past. You've got to look to the future and focus on the prize. You've got to focus on Jesus Christ and looking forward. Paul learned that. Peter hadn't learned that yet. I see something else here that uh, not only does patience require patience, and patience looks ahead but not behind, but I see also here that if you want to have patience, which we all should as Christians, we all should want to have good patience. Patience, a godly patience, will always give God glory. It gives God the glory. Here, let me explain to you what I mean by that. In, this, in these scriptures here, obviously Peter is bringing up the story of Judas. We all know the story of Judas very well, how he let Satan enter into him. See, Judas, what he was doing is he was trying to find glory within himself. He didn't have patience. He was with Jesus. He saw these things, but he did not have patience to stick with Jesus and to stick with what Jesus was telling him. He did not have faith in Jesus Christ. He didn't have what it took. He didn't have... So in order to have patience for God, the first thing I would tell you is you've got to have faith in God. You've got to believe that Jesus is who Jesus says He is. If you don't believe that, then you're never going to be able to have a patience 
that God blesses, a patience that will be uh, glorified by God. Judas never had that to begin with, so Judas can never have the patience. But I also see here that Peter, uh, he messed up. Because, uh, see, what Peter was wanting to do, let me explain to you these scriptures a little bit. What he was trying to do is he was trying to drum up something in order to get the Holy Spirit moving. All right? And I just told you that you can't do that. So what he was doing is he was trying to come up with something and said, this is what we need to do. He got in front of all 120 people. He became the star of the show. He said, I saw this scripture. I know what I'm talking about. we got to have this fulfilled because this is what David said. Follow me and we'll do this and the Holy Spirit will come. He wanted to be the star of the show. He had it in his mind that he's remembering back to the time that Jesus told him that Jesus, he said, uh, no longer are you going to be called Simon, but I'm going to name you Peter, the rock. I'm going to call you Peter, the rock, the one that's going to be strong, the one that's going to lead all these people, the one that's going to be a solid foundation. No doubt Peter had that in mind when he was trying to drum up this leadership with inside of him to be able to come up with something. Instead of doing what Jesus told him to do, which is what? To wait. Wait. Wait until the Lord moves. Not wait until you come up with something and you try to dream up with something in your own mind. And how, did, how could Peter have known that this would not have worked? Because this wouldn't give God any glory. Let me ask you something. With all the twelve disciples, who picked those disciples? Jesus picked those disciples, right? So when one of them went away and they was wanting to make a 12th disciple, who should have picked that disciple? Jesus should have picked that disciple. And Jesus did pick that disciple. It just wasn't in this timing. Jesus never intended during this time to pick the 12th disciple. He had that in mind. Do you know who the 12th disciple that Jesus actually picked? That he wanted to be that 12th disciple? Every single one of the disciples got to see Jesus. Every single one of the disciples got to hear Jesus. Well, how would that be when Jesus is dead? How could it be that Jesus was going to pick somebody when Jesus was dead? So the 12th disciple that Jesus picked, he picked him on the Damascus Road when he picked Paul, right? We know that Paul was really the 12th disciple. Paul was the one that Jesus was going to put all this confidence in. And he wrote so many books of our more books of the New Testament than anybody else. But Peter thought he had to play the role of Jesus in picking another disciple. When that was never Peter's part. What, what part was Peter supposed to play? This is like a rhyme, don't it? What part was Peter supposed to play? He was supposed to wait. That's what his job was, because that's what Jesus told him to do. Jesus never told him to go pick another disciple. And how do you know that? We can always look back. Hindsight's twenty twenty, right? Well, this this new uh, disciple that Peter picked was. Uh, have you ever heard much about Matthias? Matthias? There's not much in the Bible about him, is there? There's nothing in there because the Lord never blessed that. The Lord never called him to that. Have you ever heard much about Paul? Do you know much about Paul? We know a lot about Paul. See, God blessed that because that's the one Jesus picked. That's how you know if you're on the right track or you're not. If God is blessing the choices that you're making or if he's not blessing the choices that you're making. You should be able to see little signs along the way that he, God has blessed those things that you're called on unless it's not his timing. Now, I'm not telling you I know how to tell God's time. I don't want to pretend like I do. This message is for me just as much as you. But we've got to learn to have patience. We've got to learn to have patience and and look for God's time. But one thing I do know is we can't be a Peter and, and please the Lord when he's called us to wait. See, what Peter was trying to do, he was trying to, to make a Pentecost instead of receive a Pentecost. That's what's coming next. Y'all know the next thing in the next few chapters is the big, big Pentecost where 3,000 people is going to be saved. Peter was trying to drum that up. I know a lot of churches right now that I believe that's what they're trying to do is they're trying to drum up the Holy Spirit and get all fired up for it. And I think that's dangerous ground. I think we need to be obedient to God's Word. And when the Holy Spirit comes by and connects with you, then be thankful for it. 
But you're not in control of the Holy Spirit. We need to understand that. We can't make the Pentecost. We can receive the Pentecost. That's what our job is to do. Most of the time when we try to make something happen, all we end up doing is make a mess. That's usually the way that works. That's the way that works in life, and it's the same way that works in church. You ever done that some days, everything you go to do, it just messes up, and you tear something up? I've learned a little bit of wisdom that there's some days you just need to quit and take a break and stop trying to fix everything because everything you touch, it just seems like it just keeps going and becoming a mess. For some reason, I don't know, it's not meant for you to do that, so back away from it. Same thing with God. If everything you're doing is it's just making a mess after mess after mess, maybe you need to step back for a little bit, have a little bit more patience, and wait on the Lord to show you what to do next. I don't know how to apply that to your life. Only the Holy Spirit can show you that. But I know that when we try to, you know, in verse 26, it says, And they gave forth their lots, and they lot fell upon Matthews. And he was numbered with the eleven apostles. For those of you that don't know what lots is, it's basically like rolling dice. It's rolling dice. So it says that they prayed. It says that they was calling on the Lord to be able to give them the direction and the answer. But then they went to the world and they got some dice to figure out what the answer is. That don't look like that's leaning on the Lord to me, does it you? So they tried to, they said, Lord, we're looking to you. We want you to show us. But then in the other hand, they're reaching back here for the dice and they're rolling the dice. And God says, no dice. No dice. That's what he told him. He said, that's not what I wanted. I don't know if that's where that term come from is no dice, but God said no dice right here. He got, the, the time of casting lots is over with. We're not supposed to cast lots. You're not supposed to take things to chance. You take everything to the Lord in prayer. You take everything to Him and you wait for Him to show you what to do next. You wait for the right opportunity that feels right. Then you walk through that door if something hits you upside the head and you step back out outside of that door and say, oh, I wasn't supposed to be going through that door. That's how we know which way to go now. We don't roll the dice with life. You don't take those kinds of chances. That's not what he's calling us to do. But Peter was commanded to wait. When, when you know you're supposed to wait, that's a commandment. You better not mess with that. Moses did that one time. Moses was commanded to go over and speak to the rock in the wilderness, and water was going to come out of that, and God was going to get the glory from that, and everybody was going to see that Moses just spoke to that rock and water come out. But what did he do? He went over there, and he struck it. If you don't follow what God wants you to do to the T, then that's dangerous ground. God's got a reason for every detail that he puts on your heart and the way he wants things done. He's got a purpose that he wants things lined up. But Moses had to pay the price because he wanted to do it his way. He thought, oh, well, it will look a whole lot better if I go over there instead of speaking to that rock. If I take this big old rod that I got and it's going to put on a show, it's really going to get everybody's attention. It's, everybody's going to really remember that. He started forming up things in his own mind of the way things should go. When you start trying to figure things out in your own mind, then you're losing the Lord's help. You're doing it your own way, and he's going to step back and just let you have it. God's timing is worth waiting for. We need to have patience in the Lord. I don't know how that speaks to you tonight. Well, let's just have patience.